Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Distinguished guests, we welcome you to this side event, a side event that will be presented in four stages. The first stage is about the bioclimatic approach for sustainable cultivation of forest plants for domestic use by local communities in Cote d'Ivoire. And this will be done by the Office of the Park and Reserve of Cote d'Ivoire. And we will have two of his partners, the Wabilet Project, funded by the USID and the GIZ, the International German Corporation. On this stage, I will quickly call Dr. Dr. Abdullah Jarasuba from OEPR to quickly join the stage, and Dr. Nohum Dam. As mentioned earlier, this side event has four parts. The first part is about the bioclimatic approach for a sustainable culture of forest plant for domestic use. The second one has a quite catchy title. It says, I have a dream. Youth will be speaking for a nature positive future. And we will have the case of the Atewa Forest in Ghana for nature-based solution regarding critical public good. It's about public funding. And lastly, we will have the 30 by 30 in the Hindu Kush Himalaya. So those four side events will be running through from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. this afternoon. Without spending more time, we will quickly get into the gist of the topic. Dr. Abdullahi, you are working with OIPR, the Office of the Park and Reserve of Côte d'Ivoire, and you have started an approach, a bioclimatic approach to cultivation of forest plant for domestic use by local community. Can you please tell us more about that initiative? Bonjour, chers participants. J'ai l'honneur ici de vous présenter l'initiative de domestication des plantes alimentaires utiles. Quand on dit toutes les plantes sont utiles, mais l'utilité ici présentée elle est particulière, alimentaire ou médicinale. Et vous savez que tous comme moi que la Côte d'Ivoire est le premier producteur de cacao. Et 40% de cette production est faite autour du parc national de Taï. Et ce qui a entraîné ou est la base d'une forte migration hein, pour l'agriculture, surtout la cacaoculture, ça a permis d'occasionner euh, la destruction de tout le couvert forestier et ça a laissé le parc comme une île dans un. Euh, des airs comme je pourrais m'exprimer ainsi, de cacao et de, 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 de VA. Alors, une forte pression sur les ressources, parce que eh, la zone, euh, habituellement, traditionnellement, les gens, c'était des chasseurs cueilleurs et les ressources forestières qu'ils avaient à leur portée n'existent plus, tout est café, cacao et VA. Donc, où ils vont se retrouver C'est à l'intérieur du parc pour retrouver ces, ces, ces espèces. Alors, vu la pression grandissante, l'Office ivoirien des parcs et réserves a développé une stratégie, un système d'agroforesterie basé sur quelques plantes qui sont prisées par les communautés. Il s'agit de Irivergia, de Blech Media et autres. Alors, nous avons commencé à domestiquer ces plants depuis 2015. On a produit déjà plus de 500 000 plants distribués gratuitement aux communautés et certaines 
de ces plantes ont commencé à produire. Et il y a plus de 5000 planteurs qui ont eu accès à ces plants. Et ça couvre plus de 9500 hectares de plantation de cacao à la périphérie du parc. Il y a un fort engouement, surtout que c'est les femmes qui sont les plus impliquées, parce que le cacao qui est produit, c'est pour les hommes. Et quelques arbres forestiers dans les plantations, ça fait l'affaire des femmes. Et les jeunes également sont très impliqués. Et pour arriver à notre, atteindre nos objectifs, nous avons impliqué la communauté scientifique pour faire en sorte que les, les délais de production de ces plantes-là puissent être réduits. Réduit. Alors, ces premiers plants plantés en 2015 ont commencé à produire et nous avons fait une étude de marché, savoir qu'est-ce que les communautés peuvent gagner. Et cette étude a montré que pour un coût de production d'environ 1 dollar, à la vente, ces personnes-là se retrouvent avec une, un, un, coût de 5, un prix de vente de 5 dollars par kilo. Trois fois, quatre fois plus cher que le cacao qui attire tant de personnes à la périphérie. Et ce qui va nous permettre de diminuer dans le futur la pression sur les ressources du parc. Voilà euh, le premier point présenté. Si je retiens bien, vous avez adopté une approche qui met les femmes au centre. Et au-delà de cela, vous utilisez la biodiversité pour le développement durable. Donc, en fait, la diversité biologique est au service du développement durable. Sur ce, je me tourne vers le docteur Ndam, qui travaille également dans la zone du complexe Taï, Grebo, Kran, Nsapo, et au-delà de cela, dans les autres pays de l'Afrique centrale. Nous parlons à travers le Wabidel des changements climatiques the low emission carbon. What can you tell us about your intervention in the area when it comes to bioclimatic approach? Thank you. Uh, we work in Central uh, West Africa, and it's a program called West Africa Biodiversity and Low Emission Development. It's a program founded by USID, and it covers many countries in ECOWAS country. And the focus is that uh, only 10% of the West African forest remain intact, and they are fragmented. And what Dr. Jarosuba said, that they become like an island when you, have, you see the map. Our idea is how do we extend the greenery? How do we connect the block? How do we... Uh, value the biodiversity. So the program that we are funding, one is about assessing the biodiversity across those landscapes. First to have a list, updated list of biodiversity, training people to understand and appreciate biodiversity, having focus group with community to understand the uses and identifying list of species that are useful to them so that we can encourage them to plant outside the protected area. One other project is about uh, planting the corridors, making sure that the uh, uh, protected area in one country is connected to another, like the Thai National Park in Cote d'Ivoire and Grebo Crown in Liberia. So we are working with the communities to plan the corridor, it's about four kilometers corridor, and it's working very well, but you have to choose the species that they are useful, um, uh, which is useful to them. The third one is that we want to tack the, some key species within the park, like elephant, to understand their movement. Do they cross the boundary? Where are they crossing? And how can we understand that? So it's very, very key when you are trying to promote uh, tree planting outside the protected area to make sure that you are identifying valuable plants that community will like, but also making sure that the biodiversity is known and preserved, and also that the corridor 
is being uh, protected. And when you look at the key element of the deforestation is cocoa. And most of the leading country producing cocoa is from that region, Cote d'Ivoire, Ghana, and, and so on. So the forest is going, and very soon that leadership may drop. So how do we maintain the leadership in cocoa production and maintain the forest that stimulate that production? So we are assessing this, first of all, to see uh, the value of the forest in terms of carbon contribution and compare it with carbon assessment outside for people to see that there is a value in, in keeping the forest. So, and we are not alone. We work with other partners, and GIZ is one of, of them. And it will be good, you as a coordinator, but us as an expert, to tell us a little bit about what GIZ is doing in the landscape. Thank you, Nohum. But just to remind you that I'm just facilitating this meeting. I'm not supposed to be speaking directly. But still, I'm just going to quickly share a bit some of our experiences in the landscape, the TGS landscape, which is in Ivory Coast and in Liberia. Here, when we talk about the bioclimatic approach to, to, to forest planting, we first look at degraded land within the community. And rightfully said by um, Dr. Abdullahi, is that as we work with the community, we make sure that species that are endangered, you know, of, and all those who are completely uh, inexistent anymore in the local community, but are still found in the national park, we make sure that we try and transplant them and replant them in the community because they, they need these species for their survival. So it, it is important to bring in the restoration pattern um, plants that are useful for the community. That's one thing. The second thing is that we also identify high value conservation areas because within the community we still have some residual forest that we really endeavor to make sure that there is a connectivity between this forest. And, and that is key because our project is about restoring the connectivity between the Tai, the Grebokran, and the Sapo national parks. And that cannot be done without the involvement of the community because they are the custodians of this land. They are the custodians of the natural resources that we endeavor to protect. So be that as it may, it's also important to realize that the spread of chemicals when it comes to agriculture um, have no boundaries. We, we, we don't always have the full knowledge of the spread of these chemicals that are being used. So it is important to have the nexus between the agroforestry and this value chain product that we are bringing within the community. And to make sure that these cultures are basically um, uh, done in a biological way. We create a microclimate within these areas and make sure that everything that, that comes within the cultivation of this plant has some kind of balanced biological means. And this is quite important, and I, I want to share briefly with you um, um, what has been done in Ivory Coast with a man called Ambransko. is currently one of the best cocoa producers in the world, certified, approved, and his cocoa costs virtually 10 times the normal price on the market. Why? Because he has been sustainably using this biological method. It is possible, it is doable. And we are here actually to promote that and to say, yes, of course, we want cocoa. Ivory Coast is the first producer in the world, but there has also been some undertaking saying that we do not, we, we, we want free deforestation cocoa. We also want cocoa that are produced in respect of the environment and for us to be able to achieve that, definitely we have to get engaged. We have to promote this biological means. 
And it is important for the community to, in to also understand that it is important, not just for us as park managers, but also for them who are involved into that. In terms of income generating activities, I mean, they have more to gain and their participation, their active and effective participation is key to the success of all this initiative. So with this, I don't know if there are any questions for this first round of intervention here, or should we proceed to ask again, um, Dr. Jarasuba, that what has been your success rate when it comes to planting these trees? You, you have been doing this from 2015 up to now. What are the lessons learned? Quelles sont les leçons apprises de cette initiative? Bien, euh, le parc national de Taï, euh, de par son bon état de conservation, d'abord il est site du patrimoine mondial de l'humanité, il est également site de réserve de biosphère, et un site très bien conservé. Et comme je l'ai dit tantôt, euh, euh, autour du site, il n'y a plus de forêt. Et comment faire en sorte que les communautés puissent vivre aisément de leur agriculture tout en préservant les ressources du parc national de Taï C'est un challenge et c'est ce qui nous a poussé à travailler avec eux, savoir quest ce qu'ils veulent. Donc le processus a commencé. J'avoue que euh, aujourd'hui c'est une satisfaction parce que euh, la pression sur les ressources euh, biologiques du parc a beaucoup baissé et parce que les premiers plants ont commencé à produire et euh, ça va permettre de reverdir la production cacaoyère pour contribuer même à la certification de cette production et améliorer le revenu des, des communautés. Et comme nous sommes dans un processus de le fait que le parc soit isolé de façon écologique, je pense que nous pensons que ce système agroforestier va permettre de créer le lien entre les forêts du Libéria qui sont encore bien conservées et le parc parce que l'agroforesterie doit partir sur une base de volontariat. Si vous imposez des espèces à des personnes qui n'en font qui n'en ont pas besoin, alors ils ne vont pas le suivre. Elles ne vont pas le suivre. Donc, c'est les espèces végétales qu'elles veulent mettre en place que nous eh, produisons. Alors, on cherche les semences à l'intérieur du parc, on produit pour, pour, pour eux et on leur donne ça gratuitement. Et il y a un, une certaine motivation. Et si la couverture forest, la couverture de la zone périphérique du parc est, est reboisée et que la forêt se reconstitue, c'est un élément de lutte contre les effets du changement climatique. Parce que le parc est bien conservé et si on arrive à réverdir au tout autour, on aura atteint nos objectifs. So I understand that um, the Thai National Park is today one of the cream and the well-protected area in West Africa. And in the area where we are operating, we are actually um, working within the three last best conserved, you know, forest in West Africa. So it is definitely key, not only to have the community involved, but also to make sure that when it comes to climate change, climate resilience and climate mitigation, we should have the rightful approach. Because just importing theories would definitely not work. We want to establish con connectivity because connectivity is survival, it is life. But that cannot be done at the expense of the community who have already given their land up for protection and conservation. So I, I, I'm, I'm looking at Dr. Nohum you are currently with Wabilet, but before Wabilet there was Wabig, and you have always been working in this area of climate change. What has been the progress made so far? Yeah, uh, thank you. We have been working in the um, Upper Guinea Forest, and the first thing in that area is that 
the remaining forests are transboundaries. And um, people used to this approach of my side of thing and taking care, but animals don't know that. They cross and recross and so on. So the first thing for all was to regroup the players, the stakeholders, making sure that traditional um, uh, people here are well known to those who are on the other side of the world and having these regular meetings. The same thing with the foresters and up to the decision makers. And one of the townscape is the DJ of the office uh, Guinean uh, uh, Ivoirian the Park Reserve, where they sit yearly discussing the issue of the transboundary. And this has been very, very construction, with, uh, constructive. We signed an agreement with um, Liberia and Guinea for transboundary of Ziyama, Wologize. We signed an agreement with Gola between Liberia and, 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 and uh, Sierra Leone. We are about to sign another one, hopefully next year, with Cote d'Ivoire and Liberia. And they have been very active, patrolling, uncovering all these uh, illegal activity and try to stop them. I tell you, the key for me in terms of promoting um, community involvement in conservation beyond just giving their land is showing them the interest that you want to produce this for them. We are doing the, the assessment together. They will see diversity of plants inside the forest. And when we assess the same thing outside the forest, they can see the lack of that diversity. And we are telling them the importance of those three in terms of their pro agricultural productivity so they can understand that. So it's local capacity working together and taking your time. We have been there since 2015. And it's not like uh, uh, you're cultivating maize. It's forest. So you take time. So we, we think 15, 30 years of USID support there is not even enough. But we are going that direction. We are so happy. No, I, I, I'm not sure if we have all that time to wait, <laughs> 13 to 15 years. But um, be that as it may, probably what we also need to, to, you know, to take away is that community knowledge is key. They have been protecting. If we were able to find these um, forests today, it's because the community have been working for the protection of this land. Whether it has been a sacred land or a specific uh, um, land for them with a specific interest. So it is important for them to be at the center of whatever initiative we are taking. They have the know-how. And of course, with the support that is brought in by the different partners and also state, uh, state actors can fasten up the process. But we should not undermine that knowledge, that traditional knowledge that is key, and their effective participation in uh, biodiversity conservation. So with this, I will just ask if there is anyone who has any question to this panel, um, we can take two or three questions. We only have, we only had 30 minutes and I'm sure it's quickly running out. Yes, sir. Thank you. So the question is, what is the protocol you use to choose the plants? Like, how do you engage with the community? How do you do a pre-selection? How do you find what plants are easy to put in a nursery or not? That process, I'm very interested to know about. Okay. Uh, if I say, from from the from the USID side, we have we have after the inventory, and we are doing it with the community. We have what we call uh, a, a focus group discussion in terms of trying to compare what we assess in the forest and what they know and use, and what are the names and what are the uses. From there, they, during the inventory, they recognize some trees related to how they use it, and we will be tagging those trees for seed collection to understand the ecology, to be able to 
try and grow them to get out with them in their community. That's one part. Okay, probably okay. Dr. Abdullah can. Okay, uh, c'est parti. Uh, on a, nous avons appréhendé des femmes, des personnes vulnérables à l'intérieur du parc, uh, des femmes enceintes avec bébé au dos qui viennent pour récolter, ramasser des fruits à l'intérieur du parc. And they were selected on the basis of the fact that uh, on the fact that they used to get into the park without authorization to get some of the seed to get some of the plant so those plants were actually our target to make sure that we reduce their incursion in the park voilà donc eh, nous, nous étions devant un dilemme faut-il faire appliquer la loi ou ne pas l'appliquer alors so, c'est difficile, on ne peut pas gérer le parc de façon durable si les communautés ne sont pas avec nous. We had a dilemma. We were faced with the dilemma. Should we apply the law by arresting this woman? Or should we find means actually to satisfy them? And one key issue here is that we cannot sustainably manage the park without the support of the, commu of, of the community. Alors que faire? Nous avons tenu des séances de communication, de sensibilisation, des ateliers participatifs pour savoir qu'est-ce que les communautés veulent, qu'est-ce qu'ils attendent de la gestion durable du site. Alors il est ressorti qu'il faut faciliter l'accès à certaines ressources, notamment ces plantes-là. Et on s'est rendu compte que ces communautés savaient exactement la position de ces plantes à l'intérieur du parc et faisaient la différence entre les caractéristiques de l'organisme leptique des de, de différentes plantes. Donc nous avons okay. géoréférencié toutes ces plantes, ces, ces semences-là que nous prenons pour produire pour eux. Et j'avoue que euh, aujourd'hui, euh, comme je l'ai dit tantôt, la pression a beaucoup diminué et ces plantes sont compatibles avec la production cacaoïa qui a drainé plein de personnes, une foule de personnes autour du parc. Et oh. les les, les pépiniéristes font partie de la communauté. Alors, dans le cadre du programme d'investissement forestier, okay, le... Okay. He has spoken too much now, so I won't be able to remember everything. So basically, what he is saying is, is that um, they realize one thing. These women knew exactly where to find what. They knew the exact position of each tree and the seed that they needed. So they had to map all these trees in the park and allow access to the park for them to collect this, um, um, the seed and to now prepare nurseries. So those who are part of, um, of the nursery preparation are within the community. And they had to hold a lot of workshop to discuss with them and understand exactly what they wanted. And, and, and what they realized is that they knew exactly the function of each tree. They had the full characteristic of all the trees. So they actually learned from these communities when it came uh, to this tree and they had to map them all. And okay. this also by allowing them to do that has reduced tremendously the pressure on the park. Et ça a permis de créer des emplois parce que c'est les jeunes qui font la pépinière. Les plants sont achetés par l'OIPA et fournis gratuitement aux communautés. Et tout cela renforce les services écosystémiques que fournit le parc pour le bien-être des communautés locales. So this also has created job because the youth are the one um, doing the nurseries. And the, and the park management buys the seedling from them and distributes it freely to the communities. So it, it has been quite um, a, a great experience also for them uh, re regarding um, ecosystemic uh, pro pro provision. Yes. So thank you. Is there any other question before we close? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, great initiative. Bravo. Uh, fantastic. Uh, you partly answered my question about uh, 
how did you engage youth? So that, that's a good initiative, but I'm wondering if you're also engaging them in the school system, not only to have plants for the future, but have managers for the future. Oui, effectivement, eh, la stratégie, si vous, vous pouvez télécharger le, le plan d'aménagement et de gestion du parc national de Taï eh, sur le site www.oi.ci. You can download the management plan of the park on, on their website, the OIP website, and you will see that within the management plan there is a strategy for the youth. Et nous voudrions tendre vers une gestion patrimoniale du site. Aujourd'hui, eh, les migrants qui sont les adultes, ils ont un autre objectif qui est différent de la jeune génération. Donc, dans toutes nos stratégies de gestion du site, nous avons mis l'accent sur l'éducation des jeunes. Donc, il y a tout un programme ambitieux d'éducation environnementale qui prend en compte tout ce qu'on fait comme production du plan Et nous avons eu avec la we have a very ambition, uh, uh, um, ambitious, um, ambitious program of yes, a program of environmental education, and this is for the youth, but also to cater for one of the key challenge we have, because um, the young generation of migrants have now grown up, and their needs are completely different from the youth that we have today. So we, ha we, we need to have a tailor-made kind of initiative and intervention in the area to be able to tackle the need of each category of the community. Alors, fin pour finir, euh, il faut qu'on tente vers la gestion patrimoniale parce que le, 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 les protéger, c'est l'affaire des communautés locales. Et si on arrive à améliorer l'adhésion de ces communautés à nos stratégies de gestion, on aura tout gagné, mais avec la jeune génération. C'est un défi et nous travaillons à l'atteindre. We need to move toward the patrimonial management of the protected area because um, if we are able to include the young generation in the management of the protected area, definitely um, we will have you know, better result than what we have today. So with this, I just want to thank you all because our time is up and I can see some movement at the back. So we thank you so much for attending this um, side event. And we also want to thank IUCN who, I mean, they have given us the platform to be able to share our experience with you. So we really thank them for that and thank everyone else here. And I believe that the next um, event is about the youth. They have something to say, and I like the title, I Have a Dream. So let's dream together with them. Thank you very much. <laughs>